a little bit of a digression for the least I can say, but the fact is, is that this waltz ends in a way that it leaves you so much wishing for more. And because it's already a litany of return to this, ah, oh, sadness, but more than that, it's... This nostalgia, which is not sadness because it's a re enactment of past happiness. Therefore, it is a present happiness in the past. It's not mournful as, let's say, the funeral march or so forth. It's really something about life, but in another time zone, in another, perhaps, time of the memory, of course, not in the present. And when Chopin composes this and he uses this rondo form, we have it so many times going to the left hand. The theme Interruptions of the melodic line as if short breath of emotion needs to connect to the rest of the long sentence which is not ended but needs to be moving by short, short group of words because the emotion takes you to the throat. It's not something you can say just at once. <laughs> he already does this kind of interruptions in the melodic line as if there are moments to grasp one's <clears throat> Courage to go through the emotional journey of the um, the tenderness and the passion, the passion, and then interrupted by. picture taken years ago and all confusing slightly the one with the other <laughs> no anyway in this case um, when it comes in major <laughs> Line because most of the singing is in step motion, and only when he needs to be expressive, he goes beyond the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the octave, the leap up of the octave. In major, is the leap of the seventh, or in the conclusion, the sixth. drop. In fact, elegance is the word that comes to mind. It's not a display of sorrow. It's an elegant display of past happiness. And I think that while we listen to it, we have to think about um, the waltz pattern of the left hand. Slightly not together, but mostly, because if not, it will be affected rubato, which is not right. Or predictable worse, but probably the same. Not always delaying the second beat, perhaps a little bit more straight. And only when a harmonic progression leads, for instance, to a minor deceptive cadence in major, and then all of a sudden you have. And the, of course, inevitable Neapolitan sixth. Of a stems, low stems, uh, dotted half notes that have their own melodic line. In parallel. That's the deceptive minor with diminished third. And like in Gone with the Wind, in a 
sudden accent that she says a fiddle dee dee or whatever. I think this is an elegant way to um, end that sorrow exposed inside the major. breaking melody but the harmony minor six and then we turn to the major for me it's almost a frivolous draw as if to say oh this is all that and then it goes back but really I really suffer Line is something Corto enhanced in industrial quantities, but with his charisma, it sounded so natural. And I think if not, <laughs> he has this kind of delicious um, uselessness that. Uh, appears to be the case when we watch um, past um, uh, footage of early days of a given sport where they look to play like children of today which was the virtuosity of the day uh, so it looks uh, so silly almost when they serve the tennis from under today they serve bullets and um, so the evolution of the strength makes us believe that the sport is more uh, perhaps effective today but the gesture was there just slower and I think that when we do this kind of um, antique ways or old ways to delay it's no more the time period to do that we are more in a time period where the aesthetic of the world is everything punctual everything to the dot not so much around uh, the dot and so there is little room for this kind of um, rubato and if it is accepted it's accepted for piano as it is anyway a return in the past by the fact of playing a music of the 19th century so archaeologically correct <laughs> to play some of them together just in order to leave a few that you think oh, on the spot more meaningful to delay if not it becomes an expected redundancy it's difficult to define where though it is a question of flair elegance of being Meanwhile, there are different types of effects that uh, we have to deal with when we play, especially the repeated incentive of the rubato through um, uh, ostinato, but suspended, lastinato, la, la, di, and then istinato, mi. It's almost like an oboe that would hold that or a scream. by the passing tones which obviously by their movement are expressive of the piano as an instrument rather than the held notes tend to of course decay that is the essence of the piano so also for the bass very often what could finish by hearing something combined which would be not right in my humble opinion because of the stems and here the combination of the two, which is in fact an impoverishment of everything. Uh, the most logical thing is to voice the melodic movement line and then the static one repeat it just to remember it. But voice out the other the one that moves in terms of moving not only our hearts and souls but also the values but if you choose 
used to play the top note insistently, even if in dotted halves, and leave the secondary part as merging off. Uh, Probably the antithesis of the melodic line being the king of the pieces in Chopin because everything is melodic line. Sorry for this. It's a very risky fingering, but if I didn't have the straight finger, it wouldn't have hold like now. One, two, three, four, five on the major nine. Embracing it. And changing harmony on the last third beat in A minor. These little subtleties like this escape very often in performances because acoustics, pedals, and pianists tend to just put one harmony a bar. But it's not true. Here it's one, but with the appoggiatura. And here, appoggiatura and then anticipating. because of the passing tone, or the leading tone rather. Two, three, one, three, five, four, four. I wouldn't have missed it with that, but because I used one, two, three, four, five, and I overstayed the welcome in order to create a legato by the fingers, I better have a good support of the palm to support four and five straight, and even open a little bit the um, The mist note comes always from the mist gesture in the preparation of it. If you prepare yourself position, pre-position, you never miss it. But if you forget to do it, or for some reason it's not in the uh, muscular memory of practicing, you have one chance out of two that it works, or perhaps more, but regardless, there will always be that factor of insecurity. I like the fingering 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 because I feel like I hug the octave, which the major ninth does hug so um, solarly from above, not go above the octave in the major ninth is almost like oh, throwing flowers. four bars later in minor, I mean original minor since it was relative major. You have the minor ninth. The bright sunshine solar and the moonlight. And then the seven. So you have to change the pedal before it gets, gets to be all confusing. perhaps stringendo, perhaps uh, slightly leaning forward. And you find yourself in major almost besides yourself. Really? Is this happiness real? I thought it was just the memory of the past happiness. And all of a sudden the major makes it so factually real. Almost as if the actor is in disbelief. Deceptive is the cruel remembrance that perhaps it's not real, it's just illusion. But finishing it in major and not before to go back to minor with the Neapolitan six to make it darker minor. Not 
not real. And we know that it was just a parenthesis of oh, happiness. <laughs> several times it's hot and cold because we return the second time in major with the feeling of really conquesting our fears but again the relative minor is uh, not really relative a relatively minor <laughs> um, deceptive cadence a trill that is a shaking of the soul. Like Schubert in 960 has this very dark and deep soul shaking and here it's just a... I think it should be played so close into each other on the rebounds of the keys but not fully up picked up in the middle before they're fully up and we played in a consistent glued connection even pedal less you feel this kind of minor second gluing because of the appoggiatura that is the trail of the minor second an extended appoggiatura
Is it the parlando legato, which speaks with each note? A different syllable, I would like to tell you how much all of this means to me. The in, uh, injected with meaning, um, spoken, uh, recitativo uh, style um, legato, after all, or is it the legato of what I think the right hand? Is the glued legato where the fingers stay? because, in fact, for once, because uh, the acoustics take care of that natural um, acoustical um, enhancement, uh, like halo resonance. Uh, and if you put the pedal and you hold the fingers, then it becomes totally glued. <laughs> She's like playing with the fingers dipped in jam and then afterwards playing the piano. Ooh, it would be too gluey. It should be a legato from the finger with the finger pedal of overstaying the welcome. not just the ones you play. The pedal can be used for the kind of expressive soul shaking. Basically, more elegantly, I should continue it just in my mind and my heart and not display it in front of the audience as I just did. But it's just a way to show that it's not wrong to um, uh, allow oneself to digress uh, as long as it allows us to 
play more meaningfully what, what is there. Not to replace it, or rather to, to cherish more what it's the chosen note, la note choisie, as the French like to call it. And it's not wrong that uh, a choice of a harmonic movement, a choice of a um, trill, are placed in strategic places in terms of the mood changing or mood um, creating uh, section. It, well, this is uh, just by saying it. Uh, an exaggeration, but it should be there in the motion, mostly the motion of the pulse, the pulse and the melody, the melody and the bass, the bass and the melody and the pulse, the pedal and the melody and the bass and the pulse, then the legato, or the quality of connectato, or recitativo legato, according to major, minor, or half major, or deceptive minor, in the bass, in the bass with the page, and the melodic line on the top and the bottom, and then passing from one to the other, and gracefully just concluding. All these elements are so intertwined that they aren't essential alone. They are just sort of um, in harmony in this kind of daydreamed combination of major and minor, of andante and adagio, of long phrase and short subphrases, of little ornaments a la baroque, which here are no more embellishments, but enhancements or perhaps shaking, so possibly even vibrato. And so um, so much is hinted, so few things should be uh, heavily insisted in the performance, but they should be prepared in awareness and felt and heard and um, anticipated in the direction of the finger's position with the elbow and the hand and using unacorda only when you need to change atmosphere on the spot like drastic piano or um, subito. Uh, not through, if not the sound gets to be muffled. So all of these things we probably think of, but it's difficult to think in real time. So the more we play, the more we filter all this, and the more it becomes a second nature to play this piece. More than to play is to hear it. First hear it, then write it. Possibly hear and write it, and possibly also digest it in that sense. But you go back to it after time, and you all of a sudden start seeing better the hierarchy of the elements which I just displayed, at least few of them. And that um, you have to um, deal with, if not in real time, when you start meeting for the first time the piece or the style. And it's only after third or fourth revisitation after time that the waves clear up for the essential, and then the essential appears to be for some the melodic line, for some the rhythmic, because it's a waltz. But it's not only if, it's just that it's the way to enter into it. Some people enter into it through this or through that aspect of it, and then they still blossom everything in it, and uh, if not parts of what they see in it that they would like to bring out. Which is why the listener becomes um, an involved um, reader of the piece with the uh, reading of the performer. And the intentions of the performer are as meaningful as the realizations. Fortunately, unfortunately, often the realizations don't live to the, um, to the high expectation of the intentions. But nevertheless, the intentions do count. And sometimes a piano's note doesn't come out the way we want, or too loud, or not enough, or something didn't organize itself like we wished. That's life. That's how we expect it, accept it, or expect it both. But then we deal with the unexpected with a way that is gracefully accepting it and just saying, okay, I'm going to go to the end of the phrase, it's every four bars, and I'm going to breathe, I'm going to go in relative major, and I'll return from it in minor, I'm going to hop in major of the tonic, and then return in minor, and basically you bring yourself to the, on the waves of the musical experience of just being in vibration with the piece, becoming the piece's... Um, uh, vibrating membrane between the listener and the piece and just allowing the least possible of your own intentions to overclog it because that's when the delayed every first note of the melodic line or the rubato at every end of cadence or the pedal and the crescendo and the diminuendo on the eighth notes for enhancing each hairpin more than 
even you would like or hope, but because each of them are so beautiful, each section is so in intensely, incredibly meaningful. That's why the third or fourth revisitation allows to put a hierarchy in it and you naturally dosage differently the different effects instead of just trying to decide them now with colors on the score or paints or whatever. It's just um, the patina of life that goes through the interpretation and through the life of the interpretation. And, and sometimes you go, why did I even think of doing that when I was um, earlier there? And um, I think that this is the most refreshing fact of music. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Oh yes, it does. Well, thank you.